No, I think I'd be a lot more nervous telling the story of you. Okay. <laughs> well, good. Then you can sit down. All right. <laughs> Uh, so we are, uh, we've been talking during this series about uh, fear, and I think it's kind of a timely topic because I think a lot of people are scared of one thing or another. Um, I want to tell you about an incident, an incident that I recently had about three minutes ago uh, where I came up on stage and my zipper was down, and none of you told me about it! None of you told me. Online, people, where you at? You should have told me. Um, so uh, don't worry, it's taken care of now, it's taken care of. Uh, but some things in our lives can get us scared. Um, and and I, I think that this summer, this spring in particular, have had so many things for us to be scared of. It's almost like we have a new thing to be scared of every week. And sometimes I, I, I think that like the news media or you know, like my aunt, my aunt Frida or anybody who just, who they really, really like just being like, how can we freak these people out today? Um, and then put a whole bunch of stories on about how things are the absolute worst. And, uh, and then we all get really freaked out. Um, and, and you know, in some ways it's not the worst thing, right? Cause like the people who are not scared at all are a lot of the people who've been spreading the disease, right? The, like the, the people who are not, who are just absolutely like don't care at all. They don't, they, they're not, they're not worried about it. Those are the people that are getting themselves in trouble and getting the rest of us in trouble. So a, a certain amount of like, you know, understanding and, and respect for other people is important. Um, but, but I also think like most of us are probably bordering on the other side, which is too much fear, too much anxiety, too many things that we're scared of. And so we've been talking in this series about what is an appropriate way to use fear, because fear is not just a bad thing. Fear can actually be a good thing. Um, but fear, just like any other tool, can be used incorrectly. Kind of like if you use a hammer to nail a nail, great. If you use a hammer as a weapon, not great, okay? And so any tool can be used for good or bad, and fear is that way. Fear has an appropriate usage as we understand our place with God, our place with the world. Fear is also sometimes misused uh, by, help, by making us and crippling us to forget what it is that God has for us and how powerful God is over the things in our world. Today we're going to look at a story that has always kind of freaked me out since I've been a kid. Um, and it's, it's an important story in the Bible because it's told by Luke. And anybody know what Luke's profession was before he decided to become an apostle? Yes? Doctor. Doctor. Margaret, I want you to know your sister got that one correct um, so that she, she knows that. Um, but here, uh, here is, is the story. It's from Luke chapter 24. Luke, who's a doctor, is telling the story. So some of you might see kind of why he, why he words some of the things the way that he does. Uh, we're going to look at Luke chapter 24. It's going to be up on the screen if you're here in the room. Um, and if you are outside or online, you are welcome to, uh, to pull out your weird paper, and it will be listed on there as well. So we get that up on the screen right there. All right. Um, this is Jesus after he had risen from the dead, and his disciples have heard that he's alive, but they're still not quite sure. This is what happens. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them. So like, you know, like teleportation stuff. <laughs> and said to them, peace be with you. It's definitely what you want to hear from someone who just magically appeared in the middle of the room, right? <laughs> they were startled and frightened, legitimately so, thinking that they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your minds? And, the, you know, at this point, I'm like, is he mocking me? Is, is, like, he just appeared out of nowhere, and he knows he did that. Uh, and now he's asking me why I'm scared. Uh, why do doubts appear in your mind? And he said to, and then look, he said, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Next page. There. And while they were and, and while they still did not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he asked them, "Do you have anything here to eat?" Now we've all watched enough ghost shows to know that if ghosts eat food, it just like falls out of them, right? Like so. I've seen Casper. 
So I know how this goes. But he asked them for food. Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. And it did not fall out of him. But it doesn't say that. He said to them, that's just assumed. This is what I told you while I, was, while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them this is what was written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead. And the third day, uh, and the third day repentance will, be, will have forgiveness for sins. It will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. This is such an interesting story for a few reasons. One is that a lot of people believe that Luke put this story in his gospel for the particular reason that at the beginning in the early church, when the church was trying to like solidify what it believed about God and believed about Jesus, there were some people running around saying that Jesus actually, when he came back from the dead, was a hologram. Of course, they, used, they didn't use the word hologram. They just used like like a ghostly figure. Like he, like he was he was some sort of otherworldly essence. He wasn't actually the real Jesus. And that, you know, because... Because there's that, there's that part of you, and there's a part of me that my science mind tells me, if someone's dead, they don't come back to life. So if they're coming back to life, it must be some sort of trickery. It must be some sort of weird thing that happened. It can't be him actually coming back to life. And so there was people in the early church who were running around saying, hey guys, look, I've come up with a logical explanation for how the resurrection works, and it involves Jesus just being a figment of your imagination. Like he was just kind of being portrayed from a projector or some sort of holographic thing. Like, like he, he really wasn't physically there. If you would have put your hand through him, like it just would have gone through. He wasn't really him. And so a lot of people re think that he put Luke put this story, because Luke is a doctor, Luke put this story in to say, no, he was real. He was really him. He actually had holes in his hand and his feet. He actually ate food, and it actually went into his stomach. Luke is trying to make the case to all these people who, who are trying to purport other ways that this could have happened to say, no, this is how it happened. He really was raised from the dead. Amen. Now, I want you to think about how crazy this experience must have been for the people that were in that room. How crazy it must have been for Jesus to just show up. Again, no door. One of the things we realize about Jesus is almost all the times that he appears after he comes back from the dead is he just like walks through walls, which is pretty crazy. And as, as, as he's in this room, as, as he shows up in this room, then, then he, he starts to interact with them. And if, if, you, if you notice what their initial reaction is, their initial reaction is fear. I want you to think about the last time you saw something that you couldn't wrap your brain around. Like something that you couldn't explain. So if you're online, I'd love to hear your story about, um, about what it is that you couldn't explain. If you're here in the room, um, I would love to know, and maybe you could tell somebody around you, just whisper it to them while I'm talking, like, what are, what's, what's a thing that you've seen that's so weird that you can't explain it away? I was watching YouTube the other day, because, you know, it's COVID, you got nothing better to do. And um, I was watching the YouTube, and, uh, and on the, I, I went to this, this amazing uh, website, and they were, they were showing the top 10 videos that cannot be explained. Um, have you ever seen like any of these UFO websites? Like I, I, I kind of like, I think those are funny. Like I, I just, I love watching them because I like things that I can't wrap my brain around because it kind of is like, well, if I can't wrap my brain around, it must be pretty cool. <laughs> and so there's this video that shows that people are just in a park with a monument. Um, and don't worry, it's not an offensive monument, just like a pointy stick. And uh, kind of monument, and and there is a there's as they're filming like the two people that are in front of the monument, this very obvious human being with a rocket pack, like flies in behind them, just kind of floats in midair and then flies out again, and then flies back in again, floats in midair and then flies off the other direction, and 
there's a lot of people online that like that think that that's proof of like time travel or you know some sort of secret technology that the government has. But I'll tell you what, I don't have an explanation for it. I could have been doctored, right? Like like we all jump to those conclusions. But I liked it because I didn't know what the right answer was, and I couldn't find any sort of like Snopes article to like you know prove that it was wrong or prove that it was fake or doctored, and. I don't know when the last time was that you experienced something like that where you couldn't explain it. But it, it, it's, it's, it's sometimes really good for us. Now, maybe the thing that you can't explain was something that was much closer to you. Maybe it was like something in your house. Or maybe it was like a person that you know that said something that freaked you out because they were like predicting the future. Or maybe it was, it was some sort of thing that's happened to you. I, I kind of think like this COVID thing is one of those things. Like none of us really know where this is going, right? Like with most basic diseases, we kind of have an idea of like you struggle for a while, you live, or you struggle for a while, and you die. Like that's kind of how diseases go. We don't really know what sort of effect this thing is going to have on all of us. What sort of societal change it's going to have. You know, what sort of effect it's going to have on you and me personally. What sort of effect it might have on a person who, who that we know might die during this time. Like, it's really freaky. And I don't have a good explanation for it. And there's, you know, all these rumors about how it started. And then there's all these rumors about how it's going to end. And, like, like we, nobody really knows. If you're going to stand up right now and tell me, I know all of the details. And I'm, I'm correct about all of them. I'm going to say, you're lying. Because this is, this is something new. It's something none of us have experienced before. And I, I think that, that we need to think about how we generally interact with those sorts of things. I'll tell you how I generally interact with those things. My first instinct, if it's something close and serious, is I'm scared. Especially if I'm by myself, especially if nobody's around, especially if like it's something that is, is kind of eerie. Like I get scared. The second stage for me after being scared is that I usually try and explain it away. So, okay, so I saw something I couldn't explain. It's probably some sort of, you know, solar flare or, you know, some sort of like, you know, the, the, the government's keeping secrets from us. Uh, conspiracy theories are great when it comes to things we can't explain. Um, and, and, and then you get into like, okay, well, maybe I just saw it incorrectly. Maybe there was like one of those little, those little squigglies across your eyeball that you see sometimes. Maybe it was one of those that just got in the way and I saw it incorrectly. Maybe I was hallucinating because of like the heat and the water and I didn't have water, whatever. We try and explain it away. But I, I think when it comes to God, when it comes to experiencing things that, that, that have to do with God, a lot of times our, our instinct is to try and downplay things that we see and things that we experience. And, and I think that's, that's not good. You know, you know I, I think that sometimes people who experience miracles, people in Bible times or people in, in, in other places that experience more miracles, I don't think it's that there's necessarily more miracles going on in those places. I think so that I don't have to get freaked out by it. And I think that's what was going on here is that, that the disciples saw something that they could not explain. They, they saw something that, that, that didn't make sense. It didn't fit into their worldview. Human beings coming back from the dead, walking through walls, and still having hands and holes in their hands and feet, and eating fish post death was not something that fit into their worldview. Resurrection did not fit into their worldview, and so their automatic, their automatic initial feeling was that they wanted to disbelieve it, and they wanted to be scared. And if you're like me, I, I feel like sometimes when God interacts with us, when when we see the power of God. Instead of appreciating it, instead of seeing it and saying, wow, that was amazing, our, sometimes our thing that we do is we try to explain it away. Or we try to, we, we, we're scared of it, or, or we, we try to, to figure out some sort of simplistic thing that we can do to, to say that this isn't as big as it actually is. And I think sometimes we lose our appreciation for God. I'm not talking about being silly. Right? Like, like, I don't think that you should go outside and, and, you know, things that have very logical explanations, like wind, and be like, oh, that's definitely the Holy Spirit blowing those leaves in my face. You know, like, I, I don't think we need to get crazy like that about it. But I do think that, that when we see things that are powerful that God does, we often need to retrain our brains to, to interact with those better. 
and to not be scared that he's doing something. And there's a certain amount of learning that I think comes from that. And you see what happens with the disciples through this story, that, that initially they are scared and anxious. It's, it's so funny that the Bible says they were scared and anxious. Like, not just anxious, not just scared. They were scared and anxious. Skanxious. <laughs> I'm going to think about that one, okay? Anyway, uh, and so as, uh, as, as they're having these feelings in their minds, they're they're starting to they're they're, they're starting to, to to not believe what they're seeing and, and their their first instinct is that he's a ghost. So their first instinct is to try and explain it away. And it is funny that their that their most logical explanation they come up with is that he's a ghost. Like that's any more logical than he's a resurrected person, right? Like they're both pretty illogical, but they 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 pick the ghost. And after that, as they start to realize that he's really who he says he is, and he realizes that he's actually resurrected, and, by the way, as Jesus, it says, opens their mind to the scriptures, they have this whole new appreciation for who God is. A whole new learning about how powerful Jesus is. A whole new understanding of what it means to follow God. And, and, and we see that in multiple stories after Jesus comes back from the dead, including the walk to Emmaus, where he's walking with these people that don't know who he is, they suddenly realize who he is, and then it says he opens their mind. I, I, I think that sometimes we miss out on that deeper appreciation for God, on that deeper appreciation for who he is, on, on God opening our mind to what he's doing because we're too quick to explain it away. If, if we're willing to be scared, and it's okay to be scared when you don't understand something, but if we're willing to be okay with being scared and then walking into the next phase, which is learning, a, a new kind of learning phase, then we actually start to grow. I, I'll give you an example, a really simple example of this. Um, you know, for, for a large chunk of, of my growing up years, I was taught that women shouldn't be pastors. Right? I like that the, they shouldn't be. And I I never really took the time to sit down and think, well, what happens if a woman can actually preach and does a pretty good job? Like if you were here last week and you heard Kira preach, she did a great job. And I, I hadn't thought through what would happen. And so this one, I remember distinctly, I was, I was at this church and a woman went up on stage to give the message. And in my mind, I'm like, this does not fit with my worldview. Is she going to burst into flames? <laughs> Is she going to do that crawling thing from the exorcist where, you know, they walk on the end like the head spins around? Like, like, I truly, I was like, I don't have room for this in the way that I think. How can I make sense of this? You want to know what happened? She went up there and she killed it. And then, and then I, I got to meet other women who are solidly gifted with God's with God's gifts, and I got I got to got to hear people like Kimberly or like Kira or or other you know women uh, clergy that I've gotten to interact with over the years, and see that these these women are powerful and they are like the Holy Spirit is working through them. This is something amazing, and and I had to change me. But you know what it started with? It started with me being a little bit freaked out. And then it moved from freaked out to, okay, I'm not going to walk out of the room. I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to experience it, and then I'm going to see what I have to do then. I, I guess I'm going to have to repack the box of my thinking. And then after I, after I experienced it, I was like, wow, this is amazing, and it blows my mind, and it doesn't fit with the way that I, that I used to think. I had to reform my world. I also remember the first time that I um, I got to witness a police officer and being really, really rude to someone that I loved. And, um, and, and it blew my mind again because I always thought that every police officer is good and every bad guy is bad. That's why they're called bad guys, because they're bad. Right? And this is not to say that every single police officer is corrupt, but what I am saying is that when your, when your way of thinking doesn't match what you are experiencing, you have two choices. You either say, no, 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 that's not real. I'm not going to deal with that, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> or you interact with it, you learn, you test it against what God's saying, you test it against Scripture, and you interact with that thing. And you decide if it needs to go in your toolbox. 
I, I think that you know, as a lot of us have been talking about race during this the, during this time, that's what a lot of us have been doing. Especially those of us who are who are not African Americans, we've been having to, to unpack and repack and unpack and repack and unpack and repack. And you know what? That's really exhausting, but it's still good, right? And and, and I think that there's lots of things that that can apply to. Lots lots of ways in which we think that need to be unpacked and then repacked and unpacked and repacked. And we need to be honest about the fact that our human nature wants to just make really easy black and white decisions because it takes up less hard drive space, right? Like I love black and white answers. I would love that when we come to November and there, it was, it was just incredibly obvious that there was one right choice and one wrong choice and we all just do that. That would be really awesome. Or in the next couple of weeks. Well, you know. <laughs> and, and, and I think that as we interact with, with, with things in this world, it's almost never the case that there's an obvious right answer and an obvious wrong answer. Almost never the case. Because human beings are complex. Because sin is complex. Because God's grace is complex. And there are, very, there are tons of situations where we interact with something and it doesn't fit with how we think. And we have to do something with it after that. Whether it's Jesus appearing in a room, whether it's how to deal with, you know, policing in your city, whether it's how to deal with, um, like, like, you know, having female pastors, like, whatever that thing is, we sometimes have to change our worldview and also approach things with more grace. Because if we approach the world with grace instead of know-it-all-ism, we will start to interact with things in a way that causes us to learn rather than judge. And that's the real danger of fear. The real danger of fear is that it short circuits our learning. The real danger of fear is that it, it, inter, it interferes with our ability to learn from the way that God is revealing himself in our world. When we can pull fear out of the equation, we get to see that opening of the mind. We get to see the way that God teaches us because we can pull out the fear from the situation. And then we get to really understand who God is. I don't expect that that's going to cause you to not have any fear anymore. I suspect that I'll probably be scared a couple more times today. Probably you will too. But I think what we do with our fear is important. If our fear cripples us, then we're probably not dealing with it in the right way. If our fear causes us to say, blah, 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 I don't like this, blah, 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 like, then we're not dealing with it in the right way. If our fear tells us it's got to be this way or it's got to be this way and no other viewpoint is permissible, it's probably, probably not interacting with it the right way. Fear is something that causes division, not just among people, but fear is something that causes division in and of ourselves. It causes us to think much more black and white than we should. It causes us to say things that we don't want to say and we regret saying after the fact. It causes us to do things that are impetuous and, and, and cause hurt. All because we're not willing to sit with our fear and allow it to uh, allow what it is that's scaring us to transform us. There's this amazing passage at the end of um, at the end of Philippians. And we actually it was it was our last message that we did from our last series. But I was reading it in the message this week, and I loved it in the message. Um, so you heard it. You heard Philippians chapter 4 um, from, uh, from the, the NIV when I read it last time. But I want to read you uh, Philippians 4 from the message, if my Bible will bring it up. I'm having internet failure again here. Anybody got it? Philippians 4 from the message. Let's see if I can do that. Philippians 4. You got it? Yep. Uh, you want to? Oh, here. I, I got it from the message. Okay, here we go. Um, we're going to be, read verse 6 and 7. This is just what I'm going to read to close today. Philippians 4 from the message. Don't fret or worry. This is Paul speaking to the Philippians. Don't fret or worry. Of course, he knows we're going to fret and worry, but he just, you know, he said, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, you should pray, which I think is an interesting, an interesting juxtaposition, right? If you're feeling anxious, you're having a lot of worry, 
Maybe you should pray. But then I love this. Let your petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Let your petitions and your praises shape your words into prayers, letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry on the throne of your heart. Isn't that amazing? What if instead of worry, instead of fear, instead of a constant state of, of being scared, we settled into a constant state of trusting God because God is in control, because God brings wholeness to life, because God is not black and white, because God does not see things in extremes, because God does not live for simple answers. He's willing to dive into the complexity with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would come and rule in our hearts. We pray that you would come and teach us your ways. Because we know that in you, we have the opportunity to replace fear and anxiety with appreciation of your all-consuming love of your all-knowing mind, of your all-powerful abilities. Lord, we pray that when we find ourselves in difficult situations, maybe situations where we're scared, maybe situations where the thing we're interacting with doesn't fit within our worldview, maybe it's situations where things around us seem like they are in a crazy mess, Lord, you would help us to resist the urge to, to find simple answers. That you would help us resist the urge to divide. That you would help us to resist the urge to make things make sense in our head in a way that's not realistic. But Lord, let us lean on you. Let our petitions and our praises shape our prayers. Let us come to you. And instead of telling you a whole bunch of stuff you don't know, let you transform our minds so that we can think and act more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.